and there will be a sharing this session where we will have two presentations, one from Emanuele Rodola and the other one from Ivan Keo. And Emanuele, you will uh, talk about spectral perturbation and generative models in deep learning geometry. My guess is that it should be your turn. You can hear me now, right? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, I forget that. Just, um, all right. So just one small question. Can you see the mouse pointer? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So thank you, Francois, for, for the introduction. And of course, thank you for, uh, to the organizers for inviting me. It's a real pity that we cannot meet in person mm. this year. So I hope it will happen. It will be possible in the, in the near future. So today I'm going to talk about something that's kind of um, in between what we have seen on the first day with Ron Kimmel and, uh, and Alex Bronstein's uh, presentations and what we have been seeing in these days with these uh, very interesting talks on topology optimization and shape uh, optimization. And I also uh, bringing in some machine learning for good measure. So I hope, I hope you will find this uh, interesting. All right, so a very brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. I will start with some science fiction because I mean, why not? It's going to be fun. And then I will talk about shape from spectrum methods. I will, I will make it clear what we mean by shape from spectrum. And I will take two perspectives. The first one is purely optimization based. The second one is going to be data-driven or learning-based. And then I will talk about something uh, very novel that we've been working on, like in the last few months, which I'm calling here spectral adversarial attacks. This will conclude my, my presentation. All right, so let's start with the science fiction that I was promising. So this guy over here, well, this is a superhero, and his name is, is Daredevil, and he's blind, so he cannot see but he can hear very well. So in particular, he can perceive objects around him, like people, buildings, and, 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 and the street, and the cars, just by hearing the sound, the sound they make, or for example, by hearing the sound of raindrops hitting the surfaces, okay? So this is the special power of this guy. And of course, this is at a science fiction level, but from a mathematical point of view, this is actually a well-known problem. So this has been referred to as hearing the shape of the drum in the literature of mathematical physics. And well, this, there is this one uh, very uh, seminal paper on hearing the shape of the drum, whether the problem can be solved or not. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about this problem uh, for a little bit. Um, all right, so why do we say this expression. So let me start with a very simple analogy. Um, so this is a drum. And well, I'm not interested in the, in the structure of the, of the base, of the wooden base of the drum, but to me, the drum is just the flat membrane that you see on top. Okay, so this, this circular membrane is going to be my drum. And of course, I mean, this is a very brief recap of, of the wave equation that governs the, the, the oscillations that the membrane undergoes when it is hit by, by, by a stick. So we see here, down here, the fundamental solution, the wave equation on this flat domain, this is a flat two-dimensional domain, we have x and y over time. And we see that the fundamental equation, the fundamental solution is expressed in terms of phi, and these are the eigenfunctions of the Laplace operator on the circular domain and lambdas. And these are the eigenvalues of the Laplace operator on this circular domain. Hmm. So we see that the eigenvalues play the role of oscillation frequencies here in the fundamental solution. Now here in the shape of the drum is the following problem. If I only give you the lambdas, this is the only data that I give you as input, can you recover the shape of the domain, so the shape of the membrane. I'm not giving you the eigenfunctions. I'm not giving you the Laplace operator. I only give you a few eigenvalues, not even all of them. Okay. So in this sense, this is going to be um, a spectral problem, or we can call it an inverse spectral uh, problem. 
because we're looking at the spectral decomposition of the Laplace operator. And in a sense, this is also a shape optimization problem because I'm prescribing a property, namely the Laplacian spectrum, and I'm looking for a shape that satisfies this Laplacian spectrum, okay? All right, now, of course, in practice, we are not really interested in this boring flat drum. In practice, the, the domains that we, are, we would like to recover from eigenvalues are slightly more sophisticated drums, for example, this one. So this is gonna be my membrane. It's like a thin shell embedded in three dimensions. Okay, so in the shape of a lion, imagine I have the eigenvalues of the Laplace Beltrami operator of this surface. And from the eigenvalues, I want to recover this embedding or some isometric embedding of this one. Okay, okay so this is gonna be my very difficult problem. Um, so a, a couple of words on isometry and isospectrality. We know that if shapes are isometric, for example, these two chefs that are approximately isometric, they, they have just a, a small change in pose, then they also have the same Laplacian eigenvalues. So Laplacian eigenvalues are isometry invariant. So being isometric implies being isospectral. Now, the opposite question is interesting. Is it true that if two shapes are isospectral, then they are isometric. This is what I'm wondering. Well, unfortunately, the answer is no. So going for isospectral does not imply isometric. And well, this has been proven uh, a couple of decades ago, I believe maybe 30 years ago, by showing the existence of counterexamples. So if you look at these two shapes down here, just concentrate on the contours. Hmm? These two shapes are not isometric, but they are isospectral. Okay, so a few such counterexamples have been found, but so it seems like, well, this equality doesn't hold, so solving for a shape from the eigenvalues is not going to be solvable in general. But our claim is that these cases are very rare. They're very hard to find. They're very exotic. And in particular, at least to my knowledge, there exist no such examples for surfaces embedded in 3D. Okay, so we're kind of hoping that in practice, this uh, problem of recovering shape uh, from eigenvalues can be solved, at least for a wide range of practical settings. Okay, so we start from this kind of naive intuition and we see what we can do. So of course, we're not the first to try and recover shape from intrinsic quantities. So there have been um, very interesting results on recovering shape from the, the metric tensor or results on recovering shape from intrinsic operators. For example, imagine I just give you the Laplace Beltrami operator and I ask you to recover an embedding with that um, uh, Laplace uh, operator, but this has been shown it can be done. Okay. Now, of course, we're going to make it more difficult. I'm not giving you the metric. I'm not giving you the operator. I'm only giving you a few eigenvalues of the operator. Mm -hmm. All right. So we started with an empirical approach. I'm going to gloss over this empirical approach because I want to focus this talk on the, the data-driven ideas. So empirical approach, of course, we're working in the discrete setting. So we are discretizing our shapes as manifold meshes, particular triangle meshes, for example, this, this example over here. And this is what we proposed uh, as a, our first optimization-based <coughs> solution. So let me walk you through this very simple optimization problem. I mean, simple to write, but not simple to solve. So we're looking for unknown vertex coordinates, x, for example, in 3D, so d would be equal to 3. We're looking for these unknown vertex coordinates such that when we construct the Laplace Beltrami operator with using these coordinates, and then we compute the eigenvalues of this Laplacian, then these eigenvalues must be equal to the input eigenvalues that were given to us. Okay. So equal to in the sense of some norm, this W norm that I'm 
writing down here. Okay, so this is straightforward. Look for the embedding whose Laplacian eigenvalues are equal to the input. And now also we are going to impose some desirable properties on the embedding that we're looking for. Okay, for example, you might ask for an embedding that is as smooth as possible. Okay, you can use some uh, smoothness penalty over here or with the maximum possible volume. Okay, so these kind of priors you can encode in this regularizer uh, over here. So I, I hope that you are convinced that this problem is going to be very difficult to solve, at least to global optimality. So this is highly nonlinear. It is also a bi-level optimization problem. So, I mean, you see that the optimization variables are nested, are very much nested inside the energy. Okay, but still surprisingly, we were able to solve this. So we uh, handcrafted some priors, for example, a smoothness prior, we, we handcrafted um, the norm, like some rebalanced uh, uh, L2 distance between the spectra. So we did some computational tricks, nothing, nothing crazy. And, and then we solved this problem using some nonlinear conjugate gradient. So very, very straightforward optimization. And that surprisingly worked very well. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a small video. Okay, so before I start the video, we, this is the, the problem. We are given the eigenvalues of Mickey Mouse. Okay, we are not given the shape of Mickey Mouse, but only the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues you can see here, I think the blue ones are the eigenvalues that are given to us. Now we start from some shape, say a circular shape, and the optimization process deforms the shape continuously uh, in a way that aligns the eigenvalues with the blue ones. Okay, so I'm going to play the video for you. You should keep an eye on the shape that deforms and keep an eye on the red eigenvalues, which should align to the blue ones. See, the eigenvalues are already almost perfectly aligned and the shape deformed to, the, to take the shape of the, of the Mickey Mouse. Okay, so this worked very well. We, we did a bunch of, of experiments. It worked consistently well. Um, of course, working with flat shapes is not so interesting. So what we did, we wanted it to work in 3D, but in 3D, okay, in 3D, we have some ambiguity that we didn't have with, uh, with flat shapes. So in 3D, we have uh, isometries that we need to take care of. So we said before that isometric shapes have the same eigenvalues. So in particular, these two cubes with the in, inside bump and outside bump, they are isometric. So they have the same spe <coughs> spectrum. So the question is, if I give you the, the red spectrum, what shape should I recover? The one with the inward bump or the one with the outward bump? Hmm? So this is something we don't have in 2D because in 2D, the only isometries are, are rigid. Hmm? In 3D, we have non-rigid isometries. So at the time we said, okay, I want the, the solution with the maximum volume. Hmm? But this was very, a very arbitrary choice. So it, in practice, we could solve interesting problems in, in computer vision with this regularizer, but I mean, in theory, this is a very arbitrary choice. It will depend on the task. It will depend on the application that we are addressing. Okay, so this is already pointing us in the direction that handcrafting priors is not gonna be a good idea. It's not gonna work well in all practical settings. So let me give you um, another argument as to why handcrafting geometric priors is not a good idea. So imagine I give you a sheet of paper. Now, of course, I can isometrically deform the sheet of paper. I can crumple it into, into this ball. So this will be an exactly isometric deformation of the sheet of paper because I'm not, I'm not um, stretching or contracting the paper, right? This is exactly isometric. Or I can fold it into a boat or into a paper plane. So these are exactly isometric. So imagine I give you the eigenvalues of the sheet of paper and I ask you to recover the shape. Well, which one are you going to give me? So imagine trying to write down a prior 
that favors this solution. Gonna be super hard. So one idea could be, I don't know, favor piecewise flat surfaces, okay? So this could maybe give us the paper plane. Well, but we have infinitely many different paper planes. So why, why this one, why not the other one? So handcrafting geometric priors is not going to be easy to do. So the idea now is let's resort to a data-driven approach. So let's replace the geometric prior with a data prior. So our principle is the following. We uh, model axiomatically as much as we can. And then what we cannot model axiomatically, like modeling the paper plane, well, we're going to learn from the data. Okay, so our method is, is in between. This is what we call geometric deep learning in, in my community. We have axiomatic modeling, and then what is hard or impossible to model is going to be learned from the data. So now let me show you how, how we did this. This brings us to the data-driven formulation. All right, <clears throat> so the, the model we are following is actually pretty simple. So I'm not assuming that you know about machine learning. I'm going to explain you in simple words what, what we're doing, what it means. So concentrate only on the upper branch, All right? So imagine that you have a shape X, so a collection of 3D coordinates. And imagine that you have some nonlinear function E, let's call it encoder, that takes this shape, this shape embedding, and then gives us as output some low dimensional vector that represents this shape. We can call it, I don't know, a global descriptor or a code for this shape. Hmm? Now imagine that you have another nonlinear function, D, which we call the decoder, that takes the code and gives as output a shape. And we would like the decoded output to be as equal as possible to the encoded input. Okay, so we would like the x tilde to be equal to x. Now, in what sense is this a machine learning model where we're going to parameterize the encoder and the decoder with neural networks? And then we are looking for the parameters of E and D that make this work. Okay, so we're going to look for the parameters. We're looking for the encoder E and the decoder D such that the decoding of the encoding of X is equal to X. Hmm? Looking for E and D is what we call training. Okay, so we train a network, meaning that we find E and D that make this work. Okay, so in machine learning, this model over here is called autoencoder model or AE, autoencoder. Hmm? Okay, so this is, this is well known. This is not something novel <coughs> that we do. So, but our idea was the following. We're going to add another branch to this autoencoder model. This other branch, instead of taking as input the shape embedding, takes as input the Laplacian eigenvalues of, the, of X. So this is what I'm calling the spectrum of X. And now we have another nonlinear function pi that translates the spectrum to the latent code that was associated with the shape. Okay, so this is kind of an encoder for the spectrum that should give the same exact latent code that we had for the shape. And then we have the decoder that we call rho that brings back this latent code and gives uh, the, the original spectrum as output. Okay, so this requirement going with pi from spectrum to B and with rho from V to spectrum is, is written over here. Okay, so this is just saying what I just uh, explained. Okay, very good. So what, why is this useful? Why is this interesting? Well, if you are able to actually train a network that does this, well, you can do a bunch of very interesting stuff with this network. I'm gonna show you a couple of interesting applications, <coughs> but in our paper, we report uh, many more. Uh, okay, so these are just uh, technical remarks. So just to uh, reconnect myself to the previous speakers, 
So the way we compute eigenvalues, this is by, by solving a finite, by using the finite element method to, to, to approximate the Helmholtz equation, to solve Helmholtz equation, okay? All right, so why is this useful? So first application, imagine that I give you this super interesting, super uh, complicated function. Well, now you can give me a new spectrum that I've never seen before, and from the, well, this spectrum, I can give it as input to pi. And then the output of pi, I can give as input to D. Well, and I get my reconstructed shape from the spectrum, right? So I'm just composing the, one, the encoder with the decoder. So it's very simple. All right, so we just, we just did this. So let's see, let's see how it works in practice. Let me show you a couple of figures. Um, Okay, so let's, let's concentrate on the middle row. So here, the setting is the following. Somebody gave me the eigenvalues of the first shape, just the first 20 eigenvalues, no, the first 30 eigenvalues of the first shape. I don't have the, the shape, okay? I only have its eigenvalues. And then I run these eigenvalues through this model. And then my output is this one. Okay, so you see that the model is actually able to reconstruct the shape purely from the eigenvalues because this looks like exactly what it should, what it should be looking, right? So this is a very, very good reconstruction, okay? So you might wonder that maybe the network has seen this shape before, okay? Or maybe it, it has seen similar eigenvalues before during training? Well, no, because this is the shape that the network has seen before that has the most similar eigenvalues to the one I'm, I'm solving uh, now. Okay, so the network only knows this, doesn't know this one, but still was able to reconstruct the correct shape. Okay, so we did this example uh, also with as with one dimensional shapes, just as a proof of concept that it doesn't just work with 3D meshes. Okay, so this, you can look at this as a 1D manifold without boundary, okay? It also works for, for 1D manifolds. And it also works if the input that is given to you is eigenvalues of a point cloud. Okay, so there are ways of computing eigenvalues for discrete Laplace operators on point clouds. And, and you can see that if we are able to recover a 3D mesh from the eigenvalues of a point cloud, well, this gives us a way of meshing point clouds. Okay, so this is what we call surface reconstruction in computer graphics or in, in 3D computer vision. Okay, so this is already one interesting application that we explored with this, with this method. But today I want to show you two other applications that I find most interesting. Um, all right, so instead of just looking at the formula, let me just show you images. <clears throat> now imagine the following application. So I give you two shapes. I'm gonna call them the pose target and the style target. And I ask you, please give me a new shape never seen before that has the pose, so the facial expression of this shape, and the style, so the identity of this shape. This is what I want. You see, this guy has the same facial expression as this one, but the style, the identity is this person over here. This is what I want. Okay, how can we do this? Well, the idea is the following. We, once we have trained our network, right? So we trained our network, so we have a bunch of latent codes here. So produced by the encoder and decoded by the decoder. This bunch of latent codes actually form a vector space, which we call the latent space. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to look for some specific code in the latent space. Okay, so it's like a search in the latent space. Imagine it as a 20 dimensional uh, vector space. So I minimize, over the latent space, the following energy. So I look for the V such that uh, its encoding via rho is equal to the eigenvalues of this shape. 
Hmm? And such that, uh, such that, so, and, and this latent code should be also equal to the encoding of, the, of this shape. Okay, so I, I'm going to repeat. So I'm looking for the V that is equal to the encoding of this shape and such that when I decode eigenvalues from it, I get the eigenvalues of this shape. Okay, so I know it's a bit uh, of a brainiac uh, idea, uh, but if you think of this, what, what we're looking for, uh, well, is a shape that has intrinsic properties of the style target, because the intrinsic properties are captured in the spectrum of the style target. And it must be encodable like the pose target. So it must have the extrinsic properties of the pose target. Okay, so this V has properties from both. And we did this even without even hoping that it would work well, but actually it did. Okay, so we, we just minimized this using, uh, again, conjugate gradient um, on, the, on the latent space. And this is the actual result that we got. And this was not all, even lucky. I mean, this is not cherry picking. We have many, many results that work, uh, that work so well. Now this is, in computer graphics, <coughs> this is called style transfer. It is a classical problem. And actually in computer graphics, many people would say, I mean, style transfer has been solved before. Well, I agree, but the approaches that solve style, style transfer they assume to be given a correspondence between the two input shapes. They assume to know which point corresponds to which point. But over here, we are completely correspondence free. We don't assume to be given a map between the two shapes. Okay? So this is like correspondence free style transfer. Okay, so second application uh, in computer graphics is called shape exploration. So imagine the following before I play the video. So imagine that, uh, well, I start from this lion shape and now I'm, I'm wondering, so these are the eigenvalues, the Laplacian eigenvalues of the lion shape. Okay, so now I'm wondering what happens if I, I don't know, I pump up the, the low band. Okay, so the low frequencies, I want to amplify them. So this means that I'm looking for rounder features in my shape. Hmm? So what I'm going to show you, I'm going to play the video. And in the video, we actually amplify low frequencies or amplify high frequencies. So we play with the spectrum. And in real time, we reconstruct the resulting shape. Okay, so for example, wait for the moment where we amplify the low frequencies. Because amplifying the low frequencies should amplify the global features of the lion. And you will see what we get as a result. Okay. And again, this is in, in real time, but I just captured the video, but it can be done in real time. So this is amplifying, yeah, you see? So you amplify the low frequencies and the lion be becomes a hippo. Now, if I reduce the low frequencies, see? If I reduce the low frequencies, I want to have a lot of mid to high frequency information. So the lion becomes a horse. Hmm? So you see that this is what we call a shape exploration application, because imagine that you're given a data set of animals. You want a way to, ex to explore this space continuously. Hmm? And you want it to be, I don't know, semantically, well, in a meaningful way. So how can you explore? Well. If you want rounder animals, amplify the low frequencies. If you want thin or slimmer animals, amplify the high frequencies. Okay, so this kind of introduces a new paradigm for shape exploration. Okay, so second part of my talk <coughs> is, well, second and last part of my talk is on so-called adversarial attacks. All right, so, this is also a very recent direction in machine learning, and we're going to move it, well, bring it to the 3D realm. So adversarial perturbations or adversarial attacks work as follows. Well, imagine I give you this photo and imagine there is some machine learning based classifier 
that tells me correctly that this object is a, is a truck or a school bus. Now, what, a, what, a, what people can do is to perturb the pixel colors just a little bit, just a tiny bit, so that you get this photo. You see, to us humans, I mean, these two are exactly the same. Okay? But the classifier now thinks that this one is an ostrich. Okay? So this is what we call. So if this happens, then these, the perturbation that we applied to the pixels is called an adversarial perturbation. So it leads a classifier to be wrong. Hmm? All right. Um, of course, so this is not random, but you can actually optimize for adversarial perturbations. So, so you give me a classifier, and then I tr try to do my best and find the perturbation that makes it misclassified. So in a way, I'm trying to fool the given classifier. Okay. All right. So this can be very dangerous. <coughs> For example, in autonomous driving, uh, you know, there are these cars and they have classifiers for the street signals. So imagine that you attack the classifier for autonomous driving, uh, for autonomous cars, so that the, 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 the signals are misclassified. So this is going to be a very big problem. And what you see here, this is a true adversarial attack. This is not pixel-wise as it was in this example. This is another form of adversarial attack that you can actually attach labels on physically on the, on the street signal so that the stop sign is classified as a speed limit. Okay, so this is extremely dangerous and it has been done. So adversarial attacks are, can be malicious and we must study these kind of attacks and because we want to defend against uh, these attacks. All right, so now the question is, well, before I move on to the question, let me formalize mathematically how you can write down uh, adversarial perturbations. Okay, so as I was mentioning, we are given some classifier C and some input sample. So the input sample X could be the, the photo of the school bus, okay? Or the photo of the stop signal. And then I'm also given a target class, for example, the ostrich. So I would like that the input sample is modified just a little bit so that the classifier thinks it is of class T. Okay, so this is the optimization problem. So I'm looking for the adversarial example, so the perturbed school bus that is as similar as possible to the original school bus, such that the classifier applied to the modified one gives me as output ostrich. You see that the classifier is given. It could be a neural network. It could be whatever you like. I don't care. I'm not going to touch the classifier. I'm only using the classifier as a function to uh, impose my constraints, to write down my constraints. Okay? So and we call the, the found, uh, the, well, the minimum to this problem, we call it the adversarial example. Okay, so the perturbed school bus. As simple as that, okay? Of course, this is going to be very difficult to optimize. So uh, the machine learning community has been looking for ways of making this easier to optimize. I'm not going to cover them. So the general idea is that you uh, give up on having a hard constraint and then you, you replace this with some penalty term that when I'm writing here, as L, okay. So this is this is encoding the same requirement that was in the in the in the constraints. Okay. Um, all right. The second thing that I want to point out here is that usually you don't really uh, optimize directly for the perturbed school bus, but instead you only optimize for the perturbation. So this additive displacement that you add to X over here. So instead of optimizing for X prime, I optimize for the delta or for the perturbation. Okay, so just a rewriting uh, of the one I had before. Well, this is more common and, and easier to deal with because you can regularize the delta if you want. 
So if you want the perturbation to be sparse, so just a few pixels, you can ask for the L1 norm of delta to be small, for instance. Or you can ask for delta to have the L2 norm small, so you want it to be imperceivable. So you can do this kind of stuff. But some details I'm going to skip. All right. So now the idea is, what can we do? <coughs> How can we find adversarial attacks, not for images, but for 3D shapes? For example, this point cloud over here. But this is just a collection of points. I don't know if you can see it well. It is not a triangle mesh. OK, so if we write down these, so we are looking for a perturbation delta. If x are 3D coordinates, the perturbation delta is going to be a displacement field in R3 in three dimensions. We have x plus v. This will be the, the example, the adversarial example. Well, if you just do the techniques that people use on images, if you apply them to point clouds, well, of course, it's going to work. So this is a valid adversarial example. But you're going to see clearly that there is an attack in progress. You see this, this jittering. This is, this is a consequence of the fact that we are displacing points in space. So if you do this with pixel colors, you cannot really notice it. But if you actually move points of the, of the domain that you're attacking, you can really see it. Okay, so adversarial attacks that people have been working on for images do not work for, for, for 3D shapes because they are not imperceivable, which is the main point of an adversarial attack. So our idea, this is something we actually did with, with Alex Bronstein from, from the first day of the, the workshop, uh, was to regularize, so very simple. Look for a displacement field that is smooth. So that's it. Okay, so this is, again, a valid adversarial attack. This works. But the, you see that you, can re, you cannot really notice that there is an attack in progress, right? So this is just very smooth. And just because we are looking for adversarial perturbations in the space of smooth displacement fields. Hmm? Very simple idea. And well, now the question is, how do you parameterize the space of smooth displacement fields? So this is mathematically what could be the most uh, difficult thing to do. Well, actually, this is very easy to do because you can parameterize V in terms of the Laplacian eigenfunctions of the original shape. Okay, So why is it a parameterization of smooth uh, displacement fields? Because if you truncate the representation in the Laplacian eigenbasis, well, you, you get a smooth, uh, a smooth function or a smooth displacement field in this case. Well, this is due to a theorem actually by Ronnie Kimmel. Uh, so he was with us in the workshop in, in the first day. Well, this is telling us basically that if you truncate the spectral representation of a function, that you get a smooth function. It's like doing a low pass on, on some, given, uh, some given signal in a Fourier sense. <laughs> All right, so that's it. So instead of uh, solving for V directly, we just solve for the co expansion coefficients, small v. Okay. All right. Um, so let me show you a small animation, and then I'm going to give you just one more thing, and then I'm done. Okay. Okay, perfect. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so small animation, this is an attack in progress. So this is the original shape, and then we have the optimization problem that looks for an adversarial attack by using smooth displacement fields. You see how smoothly this guy is, is, is deforming. So it almost looks like a natural motion, but we don't have any parametric model for the human. So this is just natural because of smoothness. So this was our, our intuition at the beginning. Okay, so and this is actually a valid attack. It works very well. So last thing, and then I'm done. Well, these are more examples. I'm going to skip them. Um, I'm going to skip these as well. Okay, universal perturbations. This is a very recent thing that we've done. This is currently under submission. So for images, people have found adversarial perturbations that do not just work for one image, but they work for a bunch of images simultaneously. So if I add this perturbation to the joystick, I get a chihuahua. If I add it to the flagpole, I get a Labrador. 
Huh? So this is very also very interesting, very surprising, and also possibly very dangerous because you just need to find for look for one perturbation and you can attack a space of images. Can we do this for three shapes? Well, the answer is uh, no. If you parameterize the perturbation as a displacement field, of course, the displacement field uh, is extrinsic. So it is specific to a shape. Even if you find a, an adversarial displacement field for, for one shape and you rotate the shape, well, the displacement field is not gonna work anymore, okay? Because it's fully extrinsic. So we want to look for intrinsic adversarial universal perturbations. How can we do this? Just the intuition, and then I will conclude. We apply adversarial perturbations on the Laplacian eigenvalues of the shapes. So imagine you have a collection of horses, different poses, different orientation, different scale. You compute the eigenvalues. You look for the unique the perturbation of the spectrum such that when you add it to all these spectra, so the same is added to all the spectra, you get perturbed spectra. And then if you resynthesize the shape from the perturbed spectrum, then you get a misclassified shape. So we write down an optimization problem that does exactly this. Mm. Okay, so this we call the universal spectral perturbation and it works well, it works very well. It was very surprising for us uh, to see. Actually, uh, that's it. So I'm gonna skip on the mathematics. Uh, well, examples, it works well, you can trust me. Yes, so thank you for listening. Sorry if I went over time a little bit. Thanks a lot. Well, you don't, you did not really went over time. I think we started a bit late <laughs> and it was mainly our fault, but it was a very nice talk. Okay. Any questions? Um, I cannot see anything in the chat. So I have to start with a very simple question. Uh, how many uh, eigenvalues do you need to extract? Um, so you have some know. bounds on precision. So when you, that would be for instance, for your autoencoder, what would be the shape of the... Okay, so let me, let me say one thing. So first of all, it depends on the, on the shape in general. Yeah, so if you if you want to recover the shape of a, of a circle, it's easier than recovering the shape of a I don't know of the Florentine uh, lily that we that we saw before. Okay, so in practice we use just twenty to thirty eigenvalues, but they are discretized with high order finite elements. So they're not just the usual cotangent formula that you see around. Yeah. A, this is like I don't know cubic or order six. Mm. Uh, finite element discretization. So you, we can trust that they are quite accurate. Hmm. Okay, and uh, no, I think I will skip because we have a, at least Sylvia as a question and Ivan as one. So maybe Sylvia, you want to ask? Yes. So thank you, Manuela, for your really interesting uh, talk. So thank you very much. Uh, just a, a curiosity. So do you explore if there is a minimum number of agent values that you need? Or when you say a few, you know exactly a, a, the minimum number under uh, below is not possible or no? Hmm. Okay, so first of all, we have like zero mathematical guarantees in all we did. Okay, so apologies for that. So no, we actually didn't really explore a, a lower bound. So explore the upper bound. So above a certain number, it still works. Well, it doesn't really improve too much. But lower bound, I don't know. We always tried with at least 10. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it was very, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We should do it. Yeah, uh, Sylvia's question is on okay, the same line. So uh, Ivan, so maybe a short question and then uh, we move yes. on. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, Emanuele, for this talk. So, I, I had a question. It's a bit of a detail. I'm sorry about that. But I was wondering about the style transfer stuff. Um, when you obtain your result, how do you evaluate how well it fits to either the pose or the style? I mean, uh, what kind of metric can you, can you use? So, okay. So, we have one metric that we can use for sure. 
you can compute the metric distortion between the result and the style target. If mm. the metric distortion is zero, it means that this is isometric to these. Uh. So which means that this is actually maintaining the style of this shape. But for the facial expression, well, we don't really, for the facial expression, we don't really uh, know how to measure it. Yeah, okay. So we kept it qualitative. I understand, thanks. Okay, so uh, I think we are just a few minutes late. So that should be uh, Ivan's turn now. Thank you a lot, Emmanuel. That was quite impressive and, uh, Thank you. and a bit rowing <laughs> in some of the results, what you could do with. <laughs> <laughs> so now we'll change a bit of a uh, subject because uh, Ivan will talk about uh, fine scale 3D copying for cultural heritage. And I guess there is a targeting bio tapestry. That would be indeed <laughs> center of the talk. So can you see my screen and hear me? Yes. 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 OK, cool. Uh, so then thank you, Francois, for the introduction. And thank you for all the organizers for having me here. Uh, so my name is Ivan Keo. I'm a CNRS researcher working with the Grec Laboratory in the University of Cornomandie. And I'm going to talk uh, about uh, fine scale 3D copying, targeting, indeed, uh, cultural artifacts from uh, from the bio tapestry. So what I'm going to present was mainly done by uh, Mathieu Pisenberg, uh, who is a postdoc uh, also in, in our team. <clears throat> so, uh, so in short, um, what we want to do is to create uh, very fine scale uh, 3D mockups of uh, the bio tapestry uh, that will be uh, used by visually impaired people uh, in order to fill uh, those pieces of uh, cultural heritage. So here you have one part of the bio tapestry. What we want to do is go from uh, such an image that obviously visually impaired people cannot see towards a 3D representation of it uh, that they will be able to touch. Okay, so, so here we have the, the image and here the, the objective that we want to, to get to. Uh, so very fine scale 3D reconstructions of it. So uh, here's the outline of my talk. I will uh, start by briefly describing the, the context of the project and then introduce the, so the, the small techniques that, uh, that we use for, for doing it. And uh, lastly, discuss uh, the, the acquisition campaign that we, we've done uh, last month, actually. <clears throat> so let me start with the, the context of the, of the project. So the, the project is called Inclusive uh, Museum Guide. So it's a project funded uh, both by the Normandy region and by the French uh, research agency. Uh, so it's gathering researchers from uh, in, in informatics and mathematics from uh, Caen and Rouen, as well as uh, researchers in, uh, in history and uh, philosophers from the CNRS and, uh, and of course museums and also universities in, uh, in England. So the, the overall goal of the project is to ease the access uh, to museum, to, um, and in particular to visual uh, art piece, to people who cannot uh, see them. In particular, we, so because we are in Caen, uh, we are very much interested in uh, the bio tapestry. So what is the, the bio tapestry? So, it's, uh, so actually it's not a tapestry, it's an uh, embroidery. Uh, which was made in the uh, in the early uh, 12th century. So it's a 70 meters long uh, embroidery made of uh, wool and uh, linen, which tells the story of the conquest of England by uh, William, uh, who was the, the Duke of uh, Normandy in, uh, in uh, 1066. <clears throat> so, uh, what it is about the, the tapestry, uh, so it's involving essentially three characters. Uh, the first one is the King Edward, who was the, the king of England uh, at the time, and who is uh, dying, essentially. So William is uh, this character here, which you can recognize by the, by the crowd. So uh, Edward, uh, sorry, Edward, not William. So Edward uh, was uh, dying. And he wanted his uh, his cousin William, Duke of sorry about that Home, home Office, 
uh, his cousin William uh, to be his successor on the, on the throne of, uh, of England. <coughs> so William uh, is uh, this character here. But uh, there was some trouble uh, because actually uh, Edward's brother-in-law Harold, who is the character here, uh, took the throne in place of, uh, of William. Okay, so uh, this made uh, William, uh, uh, William very unhappy. So he crossed the English Channel with uh, his Armada to, uh, to fight with Harold, uh, eventually leading to the Battle of Hastings, which was uh, won uh, by William. So Harold died uh, during this battle and William uh, became the, the new king of, uh, of England. Okay, so this whole story is told on uh, approximately 70 meters long on the, the tapestry. <clears throat> and what's interesting in, in this tapestry is that it's, uh, it's made of very, very tiny uh, wool, uh, woolen liner. So we thought, okay, maybe if the visually impaired people cannot actually see it, maybe they could recognize uh, the texture uh, of, uh, say, the, the, char the characters, they have one texture, the horses, they have one texture, the background has another texture, etc. So probably, if we are able to get a, a very good 3D scan of the tapestry, then we will be able to make 3D copies uh, of it that, uh, that will be uh, touched uh, by the visually impaired people. So this is the overall context of uh, the inclusive museal guide project, which aims at answering this question. How can we make visually impaired people feel artifacts, uh, knowing that obviously they cannot see the artifacts and that uh, they cannot touch the actual artifact because uh, it's a very old and fragile art piece, which is protected by glass. <clears throat> So the, the overall goal of the project is to rethink the way that we access uh, visual artworks. So rethinks in, uh, I mean, that in, in many ways. So there are people working in the project on uh, rethinking the way we, we, audio, we make audio descriptions of the art pieces, of you know, rethinking the way that we, we guide them through the museum. And what we uh, are interested in here is how we could produce tactile representations uh, of the pieces. <clears throat> so here in this talk, uh, what I will be interested in is to tell you how we can extract the micro geometry of the scene, uh, so what we usually call texture, in view of getting afterwards a 3D printed copy of it. So knowing that it's not as straightforward as it may look, uh, because since the tapestry is very fragile, obviously we need a, a contactless uh, a method to do that. Uh, it's also very fragile to, to light, so we need to limit as much as possible the, the, the amount of light that we are projecting onto it. That the wool strings, they are made of uh, very, very uh, thin strings that are actually quite difficult uh, to get in 3D. You cannot just do standard uh, stereo vision matching technique, for instance. It will just get a, a planar surface. Uh, that there are many color changes in the, in, uh, in the scene, so it's not a uniformly white uh, uh, piece of art, so you cannot just do like simple shape for shading, for instance, etc. So all of this, I'm going to, uh, these questions I'm going to answer during the, during the talk. So, um, now I'm get, getting to, going to give you a bit of background on uh, two techniques for doing 3D reconstruction, uh, which are shape from shading and uh, photometric stereo. So here is the, the overall inverse problem that we want to, uh, to solve. Let's assume we have uh, one image, like here in the in bottom left. <clears throat> so how did that this image was produced? So there, there is a light source somewhere in the scene. Uh, so we have a light ray, which is reaching the actual surface. And the, the light is reflected and goes towards the camera. So when the light reaches the surface, something happens. There is uh, some mixing between the, the, the geometry of uh, the surface, uh, its uh, reflectance, say so its, uh, its material properties, and uh, a few other things which produce the image. So the image that we get is some function R, which we, I call R for radiance function, 
which depends both on the, the geometry called Z here, uh, the reflectance called Rho here, and the lighting. And what we want to do is to solve an inverse problem that is to inverse uh, the function R in order to uh, get to the, the actual shape uh, Z. Okay. There are many ways to, to solve this problem. Uh, so here I'm summarizing a bit uh, the, the few techniques that exist. The, the most well-known techniques, they are, they are geometric techniques, meaning that uh, they are essentially aiming at identifying features across a series of images. Uh, for instance, yesterday we had a talk by, uh, by Adrien on, uh, <clears throat> on the shape from template technique. So those techniques, usually they, they, they are not so good at getting the very thin uh, surface details. And we may want to favor rather what are called photometric techniques, like shape from shading, photometric stereo, or shape from polarization, that uh, directly invert uh, the, the, the physics-based image formation model. So I'm not going to talk about shape from polarization today because the, uh, this afternoon we will have a, a talk by, uh, by Edwin on, the, on that topic. And I will target the, the two other photometric techniques, which are shape from shading and photometric stereo. <clears throat> um, just one slide to tell you what we will not be doing. Uh, so we will not be doing uh, geometric uh, matching. Though these are very famous techniques which are well established and there exists a variety of uh, very good and easy to use software for doing so. For instance, here I'm showing some software called uh, Alice Vision Meshroom, uh, where you can just plug a, a lot of images and it will get you uh, a 3D reconstruction of the scene. But with such techniques, you, you may miss the very thin structures and well, another important thing is that such techniques only estimate the shape of the surface and not its uh, material properties. <clears throat> uh, on the inverse, the, 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 oh, the goal of 3D scanning is to estimate both the shape of a surface and its color. So here I, on the left, I'm showing some example on a comic book. So on top left, you have uh, one image of a comic book. And you can see that it's shaded, okay? So it's, it appears uh, darker here in the center of, uh, of the book, just because of uh, the interaction between the light and ge the geometry. And with photometric techniques, we are able to separate the, uh, the reflectance of the scene, so say it's, uh, its color, essentially, from its, uh, its geometry, okay? And this is possible because uh, photometric techniques aim really at inverting the image formation model uh, in order to separate what's due to lighting, what's due to geometry, and what's due to, to reflectance. So in some sense, it's, uh, it's a bit of the same problem as inverse, ring, inverse rendering, uh, which was discussed uh, two days ago by, uh, by Will. <clears throat> And what will be important for us in the context of the acquisition of the biotapestry is that photometric techniques are extremely performing uh, for recovering very thin structures. So here I'm showing an, an example on a 10 euros banknote. So actually on a small part of the banknotes that you can see here with the, the red rectangle. If you just look at the image, you essentially see uh, nothing. You see, uh, you see the color of the banknote. Okay, which is uh, the re is reflectance. But now, with photometric techniques, we are able to separate uh, this reflectance information from the geometry information. So here on the top right, I'm showing the, the 3D reconstruction. And it's very, very interesting to see all those very small geometric details which start appearing. So these, you cannot see it uh, in, the, in, the, in the banknote. But if you, if you put your finger on the banknote, you will feel it, okay? So it's very small, it's, it's essentially there just to make the, the banknote hard to, to copy. Okay, so uh, how do we do that uh, in, uh, in practice? So, the, so this is a very long-standing problem in computer vision, which is called uh, shape flow shading. So the shape flow shading problem, what it consists in is you, you're given one image, gray or RGB or whatever, or some image, and you want to invert uh, the image irradiance equations 
uh, that's, which is a physics-based model describing the, the interaction between the geometry, the reflectance, and the lighting, so as to produce uh, the image. And it's quite straightforward to understand that this is a, a ill posed problem, uh, because there, is ex there exist infinitely many ways to, uh, to interpret an image in terms of shape, of reflectance, and one image. For instance, here, this is a Adelson and Penslund work workshop metaphor. You're given one image I. Well, this image could have been produced uh, by looking at uh, this, uh, this shape from above. OK, so the shape is uniformly white, and it's lit uh, under general conditions. Say. Or it could be uh, a, a white, <coughs> uh, sorry, a, a flat, uh, flat geometry, but which is painted. Or it could also be a white and flat geometry, but which is illuminated in a complex manner. And all of these, there are possible explanations of the, the image. And there, there exists no way to tell, uh, OK, this one is better than this one or this one, OK? Uh, <clears throat> so there is no need to, here to put equations. We just understand that shape from shading, it's, uh, it's obviously an ill-posed problem if we don't have any prior on either the shape or the reflectance or the lighting. And things are actually even worse, because even if you know the reflectance and the lighting, the problem uh, remains ill-posed. So here, for instance, if I, if I take the most simple uh, radiance function, which is the Lambertian model, the Lambertian model tells you that uh, the gray level is the product of uh, the albedo, so here rho, which will be, say, 1 for a white surface and 0 for a black surface, times the shading. And the shading, it's just the, the scalar product between the light direction and the normal to the surface. OK? Now, assume rho is known and L is known. So what this equation gives me, uh, it tells me, actually, that the, the normal to the surface, it should be lying on some cone, which I'm drawing here on the top left. So I'm knowing the, the light vector. I know the measured intensity. The equation tells me, OK, I know the cosine of the angle between uh, the normal and the light source. But this is all. All of these, uh, these normals on the cone, <coughs> they are admittable. So in each pixel, there exist uh, infinitely many surface normals explaining the, the image. And so, uh, so this happens in each pixel, and so, um, so making the, the thing very ill-posed. Obviously, the normals, they will not jump uh, from, uh, from there to there, from one pixel to another. So it's quite obvious that uh, we need to impose some kind of regularization somewhere. And the most natural way to, to impose some, uh, some smoothness constraint here is to turn uh, this equation into a PDE, replacing the normal to the surface uh, by the gradient of, some, uh, of the underlying depth map. Uh, so just to, um, so we will see that this is even not enough. So even <clears throat> if I use uh, such an approach, here I'm considering the image of Lena, and let's assume, so though it is obviously not true, that this surface is uniformly white, so rho is equal to 1, and that is, it is lit frontally, so the lighting vector is aligned with the viewing direction. Now, if I solve the shape flow shading problem, um, so here with the, the iconal approach, uh, this will be uh, one possible solution. OK, it looks like uh, some kind of mountain. It doesn't look at all like, like Lena. We say, OK, maybe it's failing. It's not failing at all, because now if I move uh, uh, up of the surface and with a collocated light, I will exactly get this image. Okay. So this is, these, these are real-world data, which was captured with a smartphone with the LED of the smartphone turned on. OK? So if I just go up to the surface, I get a perfect explanation of Lena. So this is one, this weird surface is one possible explanation, which is a con continuous and almost everywhere differentiable of the image. Now, here is another one. This was, uh, was uh, obtained with another method, a variational method, where I started with the a rough shape and then let the surface evolve towards a locally optimal solution of the problem. Uh, again, it doesn't look like Lena at all, but if I watch it frontally with the light collocated, 
I will again get uh, the linear image. So these two shapes, there are two admittable uh, solutions of the problem, uh, which are almost everywhere differentiable. Okay, so the, the overall problem with just one image is very ill posed. <clears throat> now, in terms of uh, mathematics, how we, we do that? Uh, recall that we had uh, this uh, image formation model that the intensity is equal to the product of the albedo times scalar product between the light and the normal to the surface. If I assume that the camera is orthographic, then I can say that the, the normal to the surface is essentially the gradient of the underlying depth map. Okay, and uh, so the normal to the surface is a unit length vector, so I have uh, this uh, normalization factor. If I plug this definition inside my image formation model, I get a nonlinear uh, partial differentiation PDE uh, in Z, okay, with the intensity between, again, the product of the albedo times the shading, where inside the shading, I just plugged the definition of the surface normal. Uh, so this is a nonlinear PDE. There are infinitely many ways to solve it. One very important instance of this differential model is uh, wh what happens we, when I look to white surface, so rho everywhere equal to one, under frontal lighting, so light uh, collocated with the view direction. And putting all of this together, I get the, the so-called iconal equation which gives me the norm of the uh, unknown gradient of the depth map as a function of the known uh, intensity. Okay. So, uh, and here we have a way to, to understand the ambiguities in terms of uh, mathematics, because the, um, <coughs> this equation, what it characterizes, it's the amplitude of the gradient. But, uh, so since I have the norm here, I cannot know uh, the sign uh, of the gradient. Okay, I, I could be to, uh, either go, uh, going up or going down. And this is what is called the, the concave convex ambiguity. Okay, for, so for instance, here, if I have uh, this surface on the left, or this family of surfaces on the right, and that I put uh, some light above, collocated with the camera, I will get exactly the same images. Okay, and this, all of these, uh, these surfaces, they are equally admittable again. So now the question is, how do I, do I pick one? Uh, well, here I have to put some, some prior information on the, uh, on the surface. So for instance, what the, the people from the, the PDE community did is looking for the maximum uh, viscosity solution of, uh, of all of this, saying essentially that I will prefer this one, the, the one on the top. Okay, and why so? Well. In terms of, uh, we can understand it as follow that um, the world is mostly a, a convex world. So usually it makes more sense to look for uh, something which is convex than something which is concave. For instance, if you look at these well-known photos of the volcano in Hawaii, uh, so on the left is the actual photo, it's a volcano. Now, if I rotate by uh, 180 degrees the photography, I get the image on the right. It could be a crater, but my brain tells me, okay, uh, the, the image on the left is much more likely uh, that the image uh, on the right. And it's because I'm just more used to uh, seeing convex, uh, convex shapes. So this led the, the numerical <coughs> analysis uh, guys to propose a variety of tools to estimate the maximum uh, viscosity solution. So in the context of the, the iconal equation, there exists a whole family of solutions that, that can be used, going from fast marching that uh, Michael de de described uh, this morning, to Lagrangian uh, schemes, or uh, here I'm just writing some basic uh, Hamiltonian scheme. So, okay, there are pros and cons for, for each of them, but the, 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 the point is that we essentially how, know how to solve uh, the equation. And here is an example of a result we obtain with that on a real world data set of, uh, so here is a picture of uh, a plaster bust of uh, Beethoven, which is lit frontally. So, and this is the result of the, the scheme that, that was on the previous slide. So now let's look at it. Uh, what we see is that, okay, uh, we get the very thin uh, surface details, which is exactly what we wanted for the, in the context of the, the bio tapestry. Now there is a, a bit of a problem because we can see there is a low frequency bias. The surface appears a bit like a, like a, like a ball somehow. 
And more importantly, this works because I assume that I know the reflectance of the scene, which is the case for Beethoven, sorry, <clears throat> because it's made of plaster, so I know that the reflectance is uniform. Now for, for Bayeux, uh, we will have a problem because the, the color is changing uh, spatially. So uh, I cannot apply such methods uh, directly. So one way to solve this problem, <clears throat> both to compensate for the bias and to be able to cope with uh, spatially varying uh, reflectance, is to use not just one image, but a series of images which will be captured uh, from the same point of view, but under moving uh, lighting. And this is called uh, photometric stereo. <clears throat> So it's again a quite old technique, it dates from the, the 70s. <clears throat> and the, the main advantage of photometric stereo over shape from shading uh, is that it can cope with uh, spatially varying reflectance because it's able to simultaneously recover the geometry of the scene and its reflectance. And another advantage of shape of shading is that photometric stereo, uh, at least calibrated photometric stereo, uh, is a well-posed problem. So this is not the case when the light directions are not known, so as Giuseppe discussed uh, yesterday. So just to, to understand why uh, photometric stereo is a well-posed problem, let's consider a series of uh, three images. Uh, if I take one pixel I, uh, under one lighting, I have one equation. Uh, which is the same as before. So the, it tells me that the intensity is related to the cosine of the angle between the light and the normal. So this defines me uh, one cone over which I know that the, the normal is lying. Okay, but there are infinitely ad, uh, many admittable normals. Now, if I add an equation, I get uh, another cone. It will tell me that the second uh, gray level defines me another cone on which the normal is. Okay. So now I get I, uh, I get to know that the, the unknown normal is lying both on the red cone and on the blue cone. Okay, so in general, I will have uh, then two solutions, okay, two possible normals for each pixel. Now, if I add a third image, uh, I define uh, a third cone, and in an, ideal, in an ideal world, the three cones will coincide in just one point, and I will get uh, one unique solution. In, uh, in real world, there is noise and uh, measurements error, so I will seek, let's say, the, the best approximate intersection of the cones, uh, but still the solution is, is unique. And what is interesting is that, so the normal is that it has actually only two degrees of freedom, and me, I, uh, I have three or more uh, equations, so the, the problem is over-constrained, and this is exactly what permits me to uh, uh, add another unknown to my problem, here, the reflectance of the scene. Uh, to solve it in practice, so there is a, there exists a very simple way also that was also discussed yesterday, so I'll go very briefly on that. Uh, <clears throat> I, so in each pixel, I have three equations. If I take the Lambertian models, they tell me that uh, image uh, number i is equal to the product of the albedo, which doesn't change across uh, the images times uh, the shading, which is the scalar product between the different light directions and the normal. So what I can do is uh, so linearize the problem by introducing some auxiliary, auxiliary variable m, which is the product of the reflectance times the normal. And I can rewrite my system of equations as uh, just a linear system of equations say that the, the vector formed by the intensities is equal to the product of the matrix of the lighting directions times my vector m. And as long as the, the lighting directions <coughs> are not uh, all coplanar, uh, this system of equations admits a unique uh, approximate solution in m. And then by just normalizing m, I can get the albedo and the surface normal. And eventually, once I have the normal in each point, I can solve, uh, for instance, a Poisson equation to, to get back to the, the unknown depth map. So this is a very, very basic uh, and naive strategy. It works in practice as long as the, you don't have too many outliers in the scene. So in the real world, there are outliers because some the surfaces are, can be partly specular, there can be shadows, etc. 
so uh, what we do or what can be done actually is as in shape flow shading go back to, to a pde approach plug in the, the differential definition of the normal you get a system of uh, nonlinear pdes and for instance you can find uh, try to find uh, the best approximate solution to this surface of PDE, uh, which can be written as a variational problem that uh, I wrote here in the, in the center. So the, the variational problem itself is non-convex, so it's not so straightforward to tackle. There exists a variety of methods that can be used, but uh, I won't go into the, <coughs> the details here. So uh, this actually works. Uh, here are some examples of 3D reconstruction on challenging uh, metallic uh, surfaces. So here are coins. So you have here a piece of uh, one euro from Italy, 50 cents from Spain, and one yuan from China. And below you can find the, the 3D reconstructions. And what's very good for us here is that we see that there, there is uh, a lot of uh, geometric details which are appearing. Uh, and this is the reason why we, we want to use this technique for the biotapestry. Some other examples, so it works for coins, it works here for skin. So this was part of a technology transfer project with a, a company doing tools for dermatologists. Uh, so you can, it works also so for the skin. So here they are <coughs> uh, measuring wrinkles or scars and uh, acne and uh, such stuff. It works also for human faces uh, because for the, the coins and the, the skin uh, examples, uh, the reflectance was uniform. So you need to be sure that it will work with uh, non-uniform reflectance. For instance, human faces is a good example because the, the reflectance is essentially not uniform. <laughs> so it's essentially working. Now, can we use uh, such tools uh, in the context of the, of the bio tapestry, which is uh, made of very thin uh, wool strings? So this gives gets me to the, the end of the talk. So recall what we want to do. We want to uh, scan uh, the, this embroidery. The challenges that we had to, to face, uh, they are written there. So it's the fact that there are very thin uh, geometric variations. So here, OK, solved. We saw that uh, we are able already to, to estimate very thin geometric changes. And that the, the color is not uniform. And OK, so photometric stereo can handle uh, spatially varying uh, color. Now, there are a few other challenges which are um, <clears throat> intrinsic to the context of uh, Bayeux. Is that uh, we don't have a direct access to the tapestry. The tapestry is behind uh, a glass for, for its protection. And that we need to limit as maximum as possible the amount of light that we project on the surface. Uh, again, because it's very fragile to, to light, because otherwise it will uh, just deteriorate if we put a strong light on it. So I will uh, discuss a bit the, the, the last two parts. <clears throat> okay, so we started this project actually uh, around uh, one year and a half ago, and we, when we were ready to, to get uh, pictures of the tapestry, well, the, the, there is the old virus thing that started, so we got locked, locked down. So uh, Mathieu did, a, he wanted to get the project started. So he recreated the, the tapestry at home. Uh, luckily, his mother uh, does herself embroidery. So he had access to um, embroidery, which looks pretty much like, uh, like uh, the bio tapestry, pretty much. Uh, so he had some glass. So he kind of created the, the, the setup uh, at home. So here is what he proposed. Though. So. Uh, so we have the embroidery, which is placed behind the glass. Uh, it's pictured by some um, some good uh, camera. <clears throat> and uh, so everything is connected to the computer. And so you, you move the light source. Here you see that there are some balls uh, that are sticked on, onto the glass. This is uh, for calibrating the, the light uh, directions. OK, so we start, started experimenting at home with this. Here are an, an example of two images that you can get uh, by varying the light source in front of the surface. And uh, good news, uh, it, it was actually working. So we get the, the 3D reconstruction here in the middle. Uh, so on the left, just the 3D shape. On the right, I'm showing the 3D shape with the estimated reflectance mapped onto it. So the, what's good for us is that the, the fine scale structures 
uh, are well recovered. So this is good for, for the biotapestry. And most importantly, that we were able to cope with the presence of the, the glass uh, between the camera and the object. At least as long as the camera is uh, frontal parallel to the, to the glass and that we put the, the light sources uh, far away enough from the optical axis. Uh, so as to limit the amount of reflections on the glass. And in this case, the, the reflections, they are rather limited and they can be coped with uh, by using uh, the robust algorithms that I discussed uh, previously. <clears throat> so glass, glass problem solved. Now the, the last question, which was a bit harder for, for us because we're not uh, experts in, uh, in optics, is that we, we, we had to um, to limit as much as possible the amount of, uh, of light uh, energy that was projected onto the surface. So the first idea was to say, okay, then we will take very short uh, acquisitions. So here uh, the, the camera exposure time was set to uh, one divided by uh, 200 seconds. So very short exposure time uh, and using uh, a flash light source which was uh, synchronized to the camera by some uh, radio transmission. So, okay, so this allows us at least to limit uh, in terms of time, uh, how long we expose the tapestry to, uh, to light. Then when we wanted to do the test, uh, so we could, we, it, uh, obviously we cannot just go to the tapestry and take pictures because uh, it's not the way it works. It's a protected uh, art piece. So we had to get the agreement for the authorities. And so the authorities asked us to, um, to announce in advance uh, exactly how much light we will project onto the surface. Meaning that we need to measure the luminous flux which is emitted uh, by, the, by the flash. So we thought, okay, it's simple. Let's just buy uh, some uh, lux meter uh, and we, we measure the, the flash. Well, uh, no, because the lux meter, it gives you an instance an instant response of the light quantity, uh, but it does not take it does not integrate over time. Okay, so we had to actually actually use the camera as a, as a tool to measure the light intensity. So what we done we've done was measuring uh, <clears throat> in a natural condition, say the the response of the sensor in terms of gray level. Uh, and compare it to the response of the lux meter. So this way we, we could verify that the camera response is uh, linear, at least as long as you use the raw uh, images. And then we, we did some tests with uh, varying the, the distance to the scene. So here is the some longer shun surface at uh, close distance from the, from the flash and longer distance. So you can see there is some light attenuation as we as the flash uh, goes further and further. And what is actually well known is that this attenuation follows uh, inverse of square uh, intensity fall off. So here the curves, they show you the intensity in the red and in the green channel as a function of the distance between the flash and the, and the surface. So with all of those pieces together, we were able to measure exactly uh, how, um, how much light will be produced and projected on the flash. And uh, so in the end, the result was that for if we take 12 shots for one scene at one meter distance, we will emit exactly uh, 300 lux uh, times a second. And so, and this was acceptable for the authorities because in practice, it corresponds to uh, six seconds of the, the lighting system, which is already in place uh, in, the, in the museum. Ivan, so, five minutes. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm finished. Uh, so good, uh, good news, the project was accepted and we were uh, granted access to the, to the museum. So uh, two weeks ago, actually, so we, we, we were able to get to the museum. So here is uh, Mathieu taking the, the shots uh, of the, so it's the end of the tapestry. So what you see here, so there are some spheres ticked onto the glass for light calibration. And then for each uh, sequence, we take 12 shots uh, of it under moving, uh, manually moving uh, flashlight source. Okay, so repeated it. we repeated this process for uh, 12 parts of the tapestry that were selected by the historians as, uh, as the most interesting ones. 
So this is uh, what the acquired data looks like. So here I'm showing three images uh, out of the 12. So you can see uh, a few things that there are some, some artifacts here which are due to the presence of the, the balls. So they create outliers to, to our model. So this is why we need robust algorithms. But the algorithm actually work and we get uh, here for the death of arrow sequence, we get such a 3D reconstruction. Here's a result on another sequence, which is the Mont Saint-Michel, uh, which is pictured also in the tapestry. So on the top, you have uh, three images that were captured, and on the bottom, uh, the 3D reconstruction itself. And you can see that it really exhibits, exhibits uh, the fine scale details and a difference of texture between uh, the, for instance, the mountain, the castle, and the, the background. Last example on the, the Battle of Hastings. So you have the pictures on the left. Uh, on the right, you have the estimated reflectance, which we do, do not use so far. And here we have the, the 3D reconstruction with some, um, some angles. So you can see it's essentially a flat uh, reconstruction, but with very uh, small surface details. So, uh, so now what, what we remains to be done for this project is, uh, so we have already the, the three models. Now it remains to, uh, to go towards 3D printing of them and doing experiments with the visually impaired people and see if, they, if this is of interest, uh, obviously, for us. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for, for listening to my talk. Thank you, Ivan, for a nice talk and for a damn interesting subject <laughs> with the tapestry. So any question from the audience? So I have uh, Fra Francois, I have one question. Yes. Uh, I am uh, in uh, your very, very nice talk, Ivan. I'm missing the limits of the, of the method. Uh, in other terms, the, the perspectives, <clears throat> other, other than uh, 3D printing <laughs> in, the, in, the, in, the, in the method it, itself. That is, uh, uh, what do you have to modify to take into account the, the glass in front of the camera? So, so here, the, all the glass stuff is treated as uh, outliers to the model. Obviously, we could have went uh, another way and uh, put the, the modification of the light rays at, uh, inside the model. Mm. We decided uh, not to, uh, essentially, because we are not doing uh, metrology. We do not really care if we don't have a metric reconstruction. The objective is to get really the, the texture feeling. Yeah, okay. So yeah. what, what happens in the end is that uh, everything goes as if we are uh, modifying the incident light rays uh, towards the optical center and putting the camera uh, away. So we are not taking into account refraction, but for this project, at least, it's not uh, so important. Um, okay, thank you. So I think uh, Andrea and Giuseppe have questions. Andrea? Hi, thank you for the nice talk. Mm -hmm. I have a question about uh, the, the light calibration. Mm -hmm. So how did you deal? I, I saw that you were um, holding the light. Yes. So, uh, so in the experiments, the, um, the light source is manually uh, moved. And we place, uh, as you can see here, the, some uh, spheres uh, on, so on each corner of the, the image. So, uh, so these are reflective spheres. So each time you take a picture, there is some uh, spotlight uh, on, the, on the sphere. And then you can essentially triangulate uh, the, the, um, the directions in the indicated by the spots to get the actual position of the light source. Mm. OK? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Giuseppe, you have a comment? Uh, oh, yes. I, I think it would be, <clears throat> sorry, it would be nice to compare the result you get when, if I understand well, you estimated the position of the light using the little spheres with the approach I was uh, exposing yesterday of uh, determining the light position directly from the data, if <clears throat> enough <clears throat> uh, images are available. Yes. So maybe, I mean, we can uh, be in contact in the next uh, weeks, uh, because I think uh, I, can, I could provide uh, 
uh, the, the, our software, which is in, written in MATLAB, so right, quite use, quite easy to use, or you may provide the, the pictures, it's, it's the same. Only, I, we are only able to process uh, um, uh, grayscale images for the moment, but we can apply to one of the planes uh, of the uh, uh, RGB images. Yes, it would be indeed very interesting, and we, we plan to make all this data public and everything, so uh, indeed I would be very happy to, to see Okay, this. then we will keep in touch. Michael, I think you also have a question. Yes, uh, hi, thanks for the nice talk, Eva. <clears throat> um, I have a question because I don't remember exactly. So maybe your, your method was uh, suitable for color images, right? Yes. So in, in which way does, is the color taken into account in the photometric stereo model? Okay, so here we assume that the, the light uh, is white. So the, the, it has no spectrum. Uh, but we assume that the only uh, the RGB information only comes from the reflectance. So the albedo, we, we say, okay, we have one albedo in the red channel, in the green channel, and in the blue channel. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the geometry itself is uh, color independent. So in the end, we just put one big uh, variational model that minimizes the sum over pixels uh, and uh, color channels. So do you get also the individual albedos uh, of all the color channels? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe uh, Fabien, you have a question? Yeah, my question was about the scalability. If you want to, you mentioned that the tapestry is really long. So I, do you plan to rebuild it uh, entirely? And is the uh, ah. scalability an issue for the approach? Okay, that was a, it's a good point. That was uh, longly discussed at the start of the project. Uh, short answer is uh, no, we won't. <laughs> So this it, it will it will be a very interesting project actually to have uh, independent scans of uh, each scene and then find a way to uh, to create a three D panorama out of that, but we we leave that for for future work and we we will not. But uh, just to, um, to comment on that, do, do you would you wouldn't you want to uh, at least stitch a bit more some local uh, depending on what okay. you get? So. And actually, we will have to, for instance, if you look at this image, you can see that, that there is a, on the left of the image, there is a, um, a problem is because there are two, uh, the glass uh, itself yes. is separated into different pieces. So there are parts of the tapestry where the object of interest is uh, right between uh, such uh, uh, such form. So in this case, we took pictures uh, slightly from the right and slightly from the left, and we will have to stitch it. Yeah. But my, my question was more about the the way you solve the, the model and if you if in theory more than regarding to in practice how you manage to capture it but if in theory if, if you have a solution to make something uh, large or, or if you if you are using all the camera together and you have a, a problem for making something scalable yeah, yeah, yes so Scalability will be an issue indeed for the, because for instance, the image, there are HD image, so 4K times uh, 3K. So just for one image, we get 12 million uh, 3D points. And then now is, if we start stitching everything, the, uh, we will need a supercomputer, <laughs> essentially. A new project so, and a new budget. Yes, yeah, yes. <laughs> so we need more money. <laughs> OK. OK. So I would like to thank the two speakers, Emmanuel and Ivan, for this session. And I think it's probably lunchtime now. We are a bit late. Uh, that I would like to apologize because I think it's mainly my uh, 